a decades-long conflict in a region rich with natural resources. Millions of people have been killed in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, and millions more have been displaced. Can this region ever find a lasting peace? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the programme. I'm Laura Kyle. The Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo has been in a state of conflict for more than 20 years. More than 100 armed groups are fighting government and regional troops in the area. 5.6 million civilians have been forced to flee their homes. A United Nations Security Council team has just concluded a three-day visit to the country. It called for a political solution to end the fighting. Dozens of people were killed in the most recent attack by one main group called the Allied Democratic Forces, which is reportedly linked to ISIL. And fighters from another major armed group, M23, have been taking territory and inching closer to the regional capital, Goma. We'll get to our guests in just a moment. First, let's take a closer look at this region. Resource-rich Democratic Republic of Congo is bordered by Rwanda and Uganda, which are both accused of backing armed groups fighting the Congolese government. They, these are charges they deny. M23 and the Allied Democratic Forces are two of the most prominent armed groups in the area. More than 8,000 people have been killed in the last five years. Regional mediation efforts have failed to stop the conflict, and some UN troops have also been accused of killing civilians. We'll begin our discussion in just a moment. First, Malcolm Webb reports from Nairobi. M23 has continued advancing in recent weeks and it's effectively encircled the provincial capital of Goma. As its fighters move through Masisi territory, tens of thousands of people have fled, reporting that M23's fighters have rounded up villages and executed them, clearing out entire communities who are now joining the already 800,000 people displaced by this conflict. M23 is widely understood to be backed by neighboring Rwanda, although Rwanda denies it. To the north, around the city of Beni, dozens of civilians have been killed in the last week. The Allied Democratic Forces, or ADF, is widely blamed, as it has been for killing thousands of civilians in that area over the last 10 years. It's an armed group that originates from neighbouring Uganda. In the 1990s, Uganda's army pushed it into the forests of eastern Congo, where it's been based ever since. A recent and ongoing Ugandan military operation ostensibly to pursue and defeat the ADF hasn't stopped the violence against civilians. Regional peace efforts so far haven't worked. M23 hasn't obeyed regional calls for its fighters to withdraw and disarm. It has withdrawn from a couple of small towns, none of them of strategic importance. Meanwhile, a East African regional force also hasn't yet made any difference. Kenya and Burundi have sent troops. Other countries in the region are due to follow, but it's not clear if any of the troop contributing countries have either the political will or the resources to actually fight M23 or even Rwanda in Congo. Congo is due to hold presidential and parliamentary elections at the end of this year. The conflicts in the eastern provinces may prevent polling. Meanwhile, Congo's opposition says that there are already massive irregularities with the voter registration process. Malcolm Webb for Inside Story. Let's bring in our guests now. And in the eastern Congolese city of Goma, Reagan Miveri, a conflict analyst at Abuteli, that's the Congolese Research Institute. In Johannesburg, Stephanie Walters, a senior research fellow specializing in the Great Lakes region at the South African Institute of International Affairs. And in Kinshasa, Angel de Congue Atanga, the UN Refugee Agency ref representative in DRC. A very warm welcome to all of you. Reagan, let's go to you first. You are there in Goma. The latest reports are that M23 is advancing on that regional capital city. What's the situation? Yes, in Goma, there is uh, uh, fear that uh, M23 can uh, enter in the city, but this has been ongoing for the last uh, four weeks now. So, yes, uh, there is this fear, but also there is an economic crisis because 
all the gates to the city are closed, uh, as I'm um, to free is a uh, on the north side and uh, at the west side, and you know at the south uh, south side it's a it's a it's a it's a people, and then there is Rwanda at the eastern uh, side. So Goma it looks to be in a uh, in a place where they don't have uh, a lot of access to goods. And that is affecting uh, the situation in the city. People has uh, a lot of uh, anxiety and fear. And the situation in Sake, is, which is uh, the villages which, which is very close to, to Goma, there is still ongoing fighting there. So people fear for, for their lives and uh, for their economy and their, their safety as well. Is there the belief in Goma that M23 will overrun the city? Yes, I, I, I'm not sure that they, they, they have interest in getting in the city, but I think they have interest in closing all the gates around the city mm. and put the government in position that they, they will have to negotiate to save the situation in this city, which is one of the biggest cities in Eastern Congo. Uh, tell me, what is it exactly that people are fearing? Are they fearing M23 themselves or are they fearing the fighting more generally? No, I think there is a, a people are unanimous uh, when it comes to uh, combating uh, M23. Here in the city, everyone is blaming uh, M23 for this situation. Mm -hmm. They are not blaming uh, the Fed. Uh, the, the narratives that, okay, that, uh, it's a, a war of aggression by Rwanda and M23. And then one of the solutions is to to make sure that uh, the Congolese army is uh, uh, winning uh, the, 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 this fight. And mm. even if when it comes to negotiation, people are not really um, uh, accepting the, the, this, uh, this, uh, this negotiation talks, as well as the government has been saying that uh, they will not negotiate. And uh, mm. they ask for some prerequisites like withdraw, uh, the, the MTT free should withdraw from all the control areas and they should have this ceasefire. Fire. But uh, since then, uh, everything is, uh, is, is, is failing. They, they, the ceasefire has, uh, has failed. And um, there is no, uh, in the, in this, in days coming, I'm not sure that we will have the, uh, that M23 will withdraw from all the areas. So I think uh, this is still a, a challenge and then the crisis is still going mm. on. We'll certainly look a, a, more at these failed efforts to stop the fighting a little later in the programme. Just for the moment, Angel, I want to focus on Goma, on this particular area. It's a city of one million people. We're talking about a lot of people here. The gates are closed to the city. The roads are being cut off. What's your concern for the people there? Yes, thank you. Um, UNSCI is really deeply con concerned by the toll of the conflict on hundreds of displaced persons. This conflict, which has resumed for the past year, or as we are nearing the 28th of March, when uh, um, the, there was a fierce resumption of conflict, there have been more than 800,000 newly displaced persons. And these are persons who are literally uh, destitute. They are living nowhere. They lack basic needs, including drinkable water, uh, food, shelter, everything. And they are truly at risk of their life because some of them are staying nearby the highways, risking the, uh, to be killed by uh, uh, cars, that are the traffic, and uh, uh, exposed to the natural elements. These are made mostly by women and children mm. who are completely living, uh, uh, well, not living a normal life with no dignity, no safety at all. This is just a situation that has been ongoing for too long. We need it to cease. We really, our call is that in as much as we would like to continue to assist these persons, including with basic shelter and basic amenities of uh, every day, we literally actually do not have access mm. to most of them due to 
ongoing conflict. That's what so I especially wanted need, to ask there, Angel, because own. we're hearing that aid agencies are, are already overwhelmed by the numbers of people who are needing aid. Many of these agencies they operate out of Goma. It's the regional capital. If the roads are blocked to and from Goma, how can they then access anybody? Well, precisely uh, what I was saying, we already are not able to access the people by road because it has literally been, uh, 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 all the zones have been red, especially the Masisi Ruchuru zones. Uh, and even we were still accessing them by air until not too long ago when also uh, a, a Yunha's uh, helicopter was fired at, uh, thankfully with a little damage, but indeed that also signaled uh, uh, another step of the conflict whereby the helicopters of the humanitarians are no longer spared. So we are reaching really a turning point mm. whereby we called through the uh, to the Security Council who was just here last week to say we need humanity to resolve for lasting peace to prevail in Goma, in uh, Eastern DRC, in this sub-region because that is really what would be beneficial for humanity. Steph Stephanie, it seems like a dire situation is about to get very much worse. Why is M23 advancing at a time when the Congolese army has just been boosted by East African forces? You've got Kenyan troops specifically brought in to fight M23 rebels, and yet they don't seem to have made any difference. Well, I think one of the things that we've seen this time around, and we, it's important to remember that the last M23 crisis was almost as bad, and that was in 2012. Mm. What we've seen this time around, and what the UN has also acknowledged, is that the M23 is stronger than it's ever been before. I mean, we had Bintu Keita, who's the head of the UN peacekeeping mission in the DRC, saying that it's almost operating like a conventional army. So clearly, the support that's being provided by Rwanda is substantial. Um, and I think that we, we, we've known for many years that the Congolese army itself is a very weak army. It's facing, of course, a number of different armed groups. And the new, uh, newly deployed Kenyan forces uh, are only one of the troop contributing countries. I think that it's uh, unrealistic to expect them to push back the M23 on their own. Um, of course, they are working with the UN and with the Force Intervention Brigade. But one of the arguments or one of the one of the criticisms of the of the Kenyan forces and of the East African community forces is that they are in fact creating buffer zones between the Congolese army and the M23, which are effectively allowing the M23 to continue to gain territory. That's very interesting. Let's just take a step back um, from this for a moment, Stephanie, just to look at who the M23 are, because as you said, they were around in 2012. They were disarmed 10 years ago. Why have they resurfaced last year and regrouped and come back so strong? Well, I think the real question is, why has, has Rwanda chosen to reactivate the M23? I mean, the M23 is a group also, of course, of Congolese uh, fighters. They themselves will say that this is a domestic agenda, that they are not backed by Rwanda, and that mm. they have uh, aspects of peace agreement that were that were that that was signed in 2013 have not been met, for example, DDR and their return to, to the Eastern DRC, and that they also have concerns about the Congolese Tutsi community. But the reality is that the M23 is this strong and was activated at a time in late 2021 by Rwanda because of a variety, a, a number of different regional developments. We had Uganda and DRC agreeing on a road construction project that reached down towards the Rwandan border. This was considered a threat by Rwanda. We also had the entry into the DRC uh, shortly thereafter in March 2022 uh, of the DRC into the East African community, a community that Rwanda has been part of for many years. And we also had the deployment to Eastern Congo of Ugandan troops in as part of Operation Shuja to uh, to go after allied de uh, de democratic forces. Um, so a number of regional developments that in, in many people's views threatened Rwanda's hegemonic standing uh, in the region. And Rwanda has responded by by essentially supporting the M23 and relaunching this uh, this uh, offensive, which is now uh, closing on to 18 months. Yeah, very interesting indeed. Uh, Reagan, when we talk about this Eastern Democrat, this uh, Eastern African
African force coming in. We're not only talking about Kenya, as Stephanie said, we're talking about Ugandan forces, Angolan forces now saying they're going to come in, South Sudan forces, Burundian forces. It's an awful lot of countries coming into this region. What do you think of that? What do people in Goma think of all these other nationalities coming in to join this fight? Yes, I think at the beginning there was some uh, um, uh, hope, but that hope has uh, disappeared because uh, now we know that the regional force is not here to fight, and they made that clear that mm. they they are not here to fight against M23. Well, that's what uh, all the Congolese and the Congolese uh, government is uh, asking for. And that's the reason why you can see even the diplomatic initiatives are, are failing, because uh, uh, th there is uh, everyone is asking for something that uh, the other one can't give. Congolese government is asking for the regional uh, forces to come and to fight on his uh, uh, his side against M23 and against Rwanda. And Kenya is not ready to do that. Burundi is not ready to do that. Uganda is not ready to do that. So uh, th th that that's make uh, this initiative to be like a, something that will not have any results. Because uh, if they are here to uh, to just um, administrate the the but uh, uh, buffer zones. It means that they will be helping M23. That's what uh, people uh, think here in, uh, in, in Goma. So uh, the solution is, uh, is a bit diff uh, difficult to get as people are asking for different things. And uh, right now, when we saw this, uh, 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 this delegation uh, from the UN, they asked exactly that the, uh, that the government should think about negotiating with M23. Mm. Well, uh, the government is not ready for that, you know. And also, we know that we are in an electoral process, an electoral uh, year, and uh, uh, the government is not ready for that as, uh, as the, uh, the, the big part of the population is against any negotiation against uh, with M23. We have, uh, we've, uh, we, we, we did some research here with the Congo Research Group here in, uh, in, in DRC, and more than 70% um, uh, of Congolese uh, don't think that it's a good idea to have this negotiation, because this has been going on for so long. And the M23 has been uh, part uh, involved in part on, on different peace talks, and uh, this didn't uh, resolve the, the the situation and didn't pre prevent the current situation of uh, uh, to happen again. Mm. There have been so many failed uh, peace initiatives in the past. Angel, the real tragedy here is that this is a region that is so rich in natural resources, resources that the people there should really be benefiting from. Yes. Indeed, a total paradox. And for me, I say this has been going on for too long. Mm. Three, almost three decades of unrest, of maiming, of killing. Uh, it is believed that uh, between 10 million to 12 million uh, persons have perished in this long conflict and senseless violence. Um, more than uh, uh, around 5.8 million persons are displaced, not literally living a normal life. For us, we call for a stop. How many more uh, killed and more maimed and more displaced would the humanity wait for before it can signal the end to this senseless violence? Angel, can peace. I just ask you a question? Like when you say humanity, you've mentioned humanity a number of times now. Who are you actually referring to when you say humanity? I refer to Congo itself. I refer to the neighbors. I refer to the Security Council International Community, as it was just here, and precisely its role is to uh, foresee or to uh, preserve international uh, peace and security. Uh, the, com the conflict here, we know, it's very complex. Mm. It's called about the country itself, the stakeholders inside, the stakeholders around it, and the stakeholders uh, farther afield. So that is where I call humanity, because I believe in for this country to possibly find a solution, 
it takes about a global resolution, mm. starting with the country itself, the neighbors, and those further affairs, including notably the Security Council. Okay, and well, me, Stephanie, let's, let's move on to the Security Council, because they have just been to visit the region and they've called for a political solution. But as Reagan says, most people don't believe that a political solution is possible because no one is willing to sit down. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think there are different actors um, who should be involved in a political solution. From my perspective, I think what we need is a dialogue at a regional level. We need dialogue between Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, and the DRC, the four core Great Lakes countries who have been part of this conflict for the last three decades. We've seen persistent interference by the neighbors in Eastern Congo for a variety of reasons, economic, political, to some extent security. Um, but the, 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 the brunt of the suffering that is happening is happening in the Eastern Congo. Mm. It's civilians in Eastern DRC who are who are living the consequences of these regional tensions, of these regional rivalries, and of these unresolved political issues. So for me, we need to have a dialogue at a political level. We also need Rwanda at some point to acknowledge that it is supporting the M23. Otherwise, we are not going to get out of this acute crisis, and the crisis might become even worse. Now, what we did see this weekend was the UN Security Council recognizing for the first time as a body uh, Rwanda's role in supporting the M23. That's certainly a step in the right direction. We've seen bilateral actors do that in the past. Um, but what we haven't seen is any kind of um, mention of punitive or coercive efforts mm. or measures that might lead Rwanda to actually withdraw its support from the N23, which is something that we did have in 2012, and that certainly contributed to resolving that question. So I think we have two different issues here. We have the acute crisis right now with the M23, and then we have the long-standing drivers of conflict in the Great Lakes region, which mean that for the last 30 years, Eastern Congo has been the scene of ongoing conflict. Mm. And the pressure on Rwanda can come from the international community at large. Reagan, let's return to Kinshasa, where we've got President Chesakedi. He's sitting 2,000, some 2,000 kilometers away from the violence there. How engaged is he? How much of a priority is this for him to sort out? Yes, uh, we can say that right now it's the, uh, the main priority, but the thing is uh, how does it uh, uh, work out uh, on, on the ground? Uh, I think uh, politically, yes, everyone, every politician is speaking about uh, the war in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in North Kivu, but the strategy that has been uh, put um, down so far are not working. There, there is this state of this of siege, which still uh, going on here in uh, in North Kivu and in Nituri, but it, it didn't uh, bear fruits. There is also uh, the cooperation between uh, the army and Uganda. All these things that don't have uh, enough results, you know, mm -hmm. and the regional uh, forces are coming in without uh, a lot of uh, results. So, uh, and the other thing is that uh, the, the government is only doing like a statement on the involvement of, uh, of Rwanda, which is uh, factual. Uh, but beyond that, there is things that need to be done by Congolese government. Mm. Everyone should have their own responsibilities. The international community, as we said, should have its own uh, um, responsibility, the regional um, uh, st stakeholders, yes, with a true full regional dialogue. I, I, I second that. I think mm. it's something which is really important. But also the Congolese government should try to resolve problems of the army. The army is, okay. has a lot okay. of problems. I just want to move on for the moment because we're running out of time and there's an area that we haven't talked about, and that is the other more than 100 armed groups fighting in this region, and one that our correspondent Malcolm Webb mentioned, the ADF, the Allied Democratic Forces. We also recently saw some very brutal attacks by them. Stephanie, how have they become so strong, and why are they operating in this region? Well, they've been there for many, many, many years. I mean, they were there even before the war that overthrew Mobutu. Um, but largely, they became a threat to the population in the area around Beni Butembu in the last 10 years. Um, now, there are many different theories about why and how the ADF have become uh, so strong. Um, we don't know as much about that movement as we need to know. We do know that they've declared allegiance with, with ISIL um, and that ISIL has provided them with some, uh, some support, but not very much. Um, fundamentally, 
fundamentally, they are able to live off of informal taxation networks, smuggling, and economic activities in areas that they control. Um, and, and certainly that, that would seem to be their objective, is not necessarily conquering territory, but controlling the area that they are currently in. Uganda has argued that they are a threat to the Ugandan government. I think potentially that that is a, an exaggerated assertion because the ADF really hasn't been able to launch any kind of attack on Ugandan territory for, for over 10 years. Um, we, we did see some bombings happening late last year. We don't know to what extent really the ADF was operationally involved in that. But certainly prior to that, um, and still today, the ADF is a greater threat to Congolese citizens, again, than they are to Ugandan citizens. Citizens. Mm. And we've seen this um, joint operation, Operation Shuja, between the Congolese army and the Ugandan army, which, as Reagan said, has not yet borne much fruit. Okay. Angel, the Norwegian Refugee Council has again and again ranked DRC as the world's most overlooked, under-addressed refugee crisis. Would you agree with that? Definitely, yes, especially in regard to internally displaced persons. But also, of course, uh, we have close to 6 million persons who are internally displaced here. And we do have about a million Congolese who have sought asylum in neighboring countries. All those persons' uh, dream is to go back to their areas of origin to, at long last, possibly live a normal life. And this might only become possible once the, go the guns may have been silenced, once peace, lasting peace would have prevailed. That is why we really call, and they call, we call on behalf of all these suffering displaced persons for lasting peace to prevail. Really, it is more than time that um, the world, the stakeholders would agree that peace is what is needed in the best interest of everyone, including the suffering souls out there and indeed themselves, the stakeholders. Thank indeed. you. Indeed. OK, well, on that note, we will leave it there. Many thanks to our guests, Reagan Miveri, Stephanie Walters and Angel de Congue Atanga. And thank you too very much for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, that's aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page, that's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter, our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Laura Kyle, and the whole team here in Doha, it's bye for now.